Welcome to CFTC Talks. I'm your host, Andy Bush, Chief Market Intelligence Officer for the CFTC. Just a quick reminder, there's a disclaimer at the end of the show that's important for you to listen to. As listeners know, we at the CFTC are always trying to learn about the markets we watch and regulate to better understand liquidity, dynamics, and structure. We do this to ensure these markets we regulate operate efficiently, safely, and fairly for everyone who uses them or is impacted by them. Today, we're going to tackle one of the most important structural issues in the markets, LIBOR, or the London Interbank Offered Rate. Now, if you've never heard of this or you think you're not impacted by this, I'm not surprised. For years, most people treated LIBOR as something they didn't have to think about, But, as a matter of fact, there are 200 trillion notional dollars worth of these linked contracts to U.S. LIBOR. Now, these products range from business loans to floating rate mortgages to futures and OTC derivatives like interest rate swaps, FRAs, and cross-currency swaps. Now, the CFTC is interested in LIBOR as it is the primary regulator for the futures and swaps markets and products referencing LIBOR. So what's the problem with LIBOR? Is it going away? What's going to replace it? These are the questions we want to get to on the show today. And to accomplish this, we bring on someone who is steeped in the understanding of markets risks, regulations, and structure. Sandy O'Connor is the Chief Regulatory Affairs Officer for J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. Sandy also happens to be the chair of the market participant-driven group, the ARC, or the Alternative Reference Rates Committee, leading the transition away from LIBOR. She also serves on firm-wide governance committees and chairs the J.P. Morgan Chase Investment Committee. In her role, O'Connor is responsible for ensuring the firm has a comprehensive regulatory strategy. Sandy, welcome to CFTC Talks. Thank you. Thank you so much. For our audience, let's provide a bit of context for what is happening in this uh, key interest rate benchmark. Let's start with the basics. How is U.S. LIBOR created or derived? Well, the London Interbank Offered Rate is a benchmark interest rate, and it's basically the interest rate at which large global global banks can borrow from each other. Um, It is calculated each day, um, and it's not just for U.S. dollar LIBOR. It's calculated across five different currencies and seven maturities for those currencies, and and. Basically, a bunch of panel banks are uh, questioned as to what level they think they could borrow at. And in the U.S. dollar market, um, there are currently 16 panel banks. Um, and each day, the benchmark administrator, um, the IBA, uh, submits that question to them. Those panel banks um, answer the question of where they think they can they can borrow. And then the benchmark administrator calculates the levels, uh, uses a, a, a trimming methodology, and then around 11:45 publishes the rate uh, that they have uh, calculated. And then that rate is used to to be referenced to for a whole variety of contracts spanning derivatives contracts to loans, mortgages, securitizations, etc. And that's how it's done. Yeah, and even credit cards, I was a little bit surprised to see that included in the list. So it's interesting, I think, for most Americans, they don't understand how important this benchmark is. No, absolutely. LIBOR is um, pervasive in many aspects of, of financial markets. Um, clearly, uh, you know, the, the, the largest market that references LIBOR is the derivatives market. Um, so of the $200 trillion that resets based on LIBOR, I would say 95% of it is in the derivatives market. But again, that said, there are a whole bunch of products that, you know, each of us use in our daily lives, whether it's, you know, credit cards or mortgages or securitizations or floating rate notes where we might have an investment in that is currently tied to this to this benchmark. Well, I guess that certainly begs the question, what, what's the major problem with LIBOR? Why is there this movement to shift away from it? Yeah, great, great question. Um, you know, you would have seen in the press, and many people think about the the issue with LIBOR is you know, related to the manipulation concerns that had that have been out there. Um, but that actually is not the issue that 
you know, the Alternative Reference Rate Committee or the benchmark uh, working groups around the globe are looking to solve. Um, that said, I, I, I should mention that, you know, there were concerns around LIBOR manipulation, but, you know, there have been improvements to processes and governance and oversight by the panel banks themselves, the benchmark administrator, and the Financial Conduct Authority that have really shored up the actual production of LIBOR. So, back to the question. Right. What's the problem? Well, the problem is... <laughs> that, you know, the, the market that LIBOR has been seeking to measure, so the, the, the funding, uh, the trading of funding between banks has really declined. Um, there aren't a lot of transactions at all. Through the financial crisis and post the financial crisis, you know, there's just been a change in how banks are managing their balance sheets, partially because of risk appetite, partially because of regulation. And so as a result, not much trading is occurring in the short-term funding markets. And, you know, just to give you an example, right now, 300 to 500, um, you know, million dollars is traded in three-month LIBOR each day. Right. That's being used to set $200 trillion worth of activity that's referencing it. And you would have heard Vice Chair Quarles at the recent roundtable say, you know, on average, the Fed has observed that there is one transaction in one-year LIBOR against which the rate is set. So that means on many days there are no transactions. So how does the rate get set? Well, guess what? It gets set based on the expert judgment of panel banks. And therein is the risk because that makes panel banks uncomfortable. And the fact that it's not transaction-based means that over time the rate is going to be less stable and, and people may no longer be willing to submit to it. Well, it seems like one of the biggest risks would be that there would be no <laughs> deals done out one year, and therefore you you really have no reference at all for these banks to make their best at guesstimate, right? So I think that's what's been really interesting to see the development um, in, in LIBOR, which which took a long time to you know create that whole ecosystem around it. But the fact is, is that you're just really not getting the 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 volume that you need to feel comfortable uh, with the rates that are being generated for all those trillion dollars, notional amounts, granted, but all those trillions of dollars of interest rate products. So I, I guess the, the question then, um, you, you mentioned um, uh, the Alternative Reference Rate Committee. I know you're part of that. What, what's your role and, and what is and, and when did that form and, and what's, what's happening there? Because there's such a key component to this transition away from LIBOR. Sure, uh, absolutely. So the Alternative Reference Rate Committee, and I'm the, I'm the chair. Um, so you you're know, kind of actually, important. <laughs> I was the chair of 1.0 and ARC 2.0, which I'm sure we'll get to. Um, right. But the Alternative Reference Rate Committee was convened by you know the Federal Reserve Board, the Federal Reserve of New York, the Treasury, the CFTC, um, the OFR, really to address the financial stability risk that could occur if LIBOR no longer existed. So in 2014, this group was brought together um, with, with three very distinct objectives. One, identify one or more alternative risk-free or nearly risk-free rates that could be used as a replacement for LIBOR for derivatives contracts. Secondly, develop some plans around a viable approach that this new rate could be adopted in the marketplace. Um, and then lastly, um, to identify best practices around actually good contract language. So that was what it was convened to do, um, you know, because we can talk about the issues and concerns around LIBOR, but if we don't have a rate, an alternative rate to move to, that really had to be the starting point. And that is what ARC 1.0 was charged with. And as you can imagine, the composition of that committee, because again, it was, was driven to, to identify this risk-free rate for use in derivatives, was 15 of the large uh, broker dealers that deal in derivatives. And then it was expanded modestly to include um, some CCPs and ISDA, again, given that level of focus. I will also say, well, that was the construct of the committee. Now, we haven't talked about the, the ex officio members in detail, um, but again, this is a public private partnership thinking through these issues. As this committee thought about rates and transition plans, it also um, produced reports and engaged 
engage the public in consultations and roundtables, and very importantly, set up a sub-advisory committee, you know, as we were thinking about rates, to get feedback from end users. Because at the end of the day, for an alternative to really be viable, it needed to be acceptable to broader swaths of the marketplace. Yeah, and I think that's really important, uh, especially on the end user side, because uh, too often uh, it seems that, that you have people who are using the product or, or creating it, but, but the people that are being impacted by it maybe don't necessarily always get their voice heard. So I think that's what's interesting in this group, that you guys made a real conscious effort to engage the end users, to engage um, uh, uh, the public and also the, the government in, in this process. Because I think that's, when you were talking about so much money at stake, it's so important to have both sides. And, and, and given what's happened since 2008, I think it's really important to, to have that balance there so everyone feels like this is the right thing to do with the right people at the table. Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, you know, you have to you go back to that fundamental driver. We're trying to address um, a change in market structure and 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 issue out there. And so, creating a solution that is 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 workable for the broadest uh, swaths of market participants is really critical. And and again, if we really want to to ensure that this alternative reference rate um, becomes viable and liquid, um, people have to be willing to. Transact in it, um, and that is that's sort of foundational. That's right. Um, you know, with that in mind, um, <laughs> let's talk about the choice to replace LIBOR, which is SOFR, the Securities Overnight mm-hmm. Financing Rate. What are the major differences between LIBOR and SOFR, and, and what what problems does SOFR solve? I mean, obviously, it's going to be uh, most likely would be volume, right? That's easy to solve compared to what what's been going on with LIBOR. Yeah, well, let's you know start with again. The big weakness was there aren't very many transactions, yep. in, you know, that support LIBOR anymore. The the secured overnight financing rate has lots of transactions. In fact, it is 100% transaction based. Um, it is an overnight rate secured. Um, it is a a a, a uh, composed Treasury repo rate um, that spans tri-party repo through Bank of New York, um, as well as um, GCF and bilateral. Laterally cleared repo through FIC. On average, every day, there's about $750 billion worth of trades supporting the calculation of that rate. So, again, fully transaction based, which is consistent with the best practices um, you know, set by the international standard setters. In addition, um, the, the rate is administered and calculated every day um, by the New York Fed. So, the public sector is gathering all of these transactions and, um, you know, preparing that rate each day. Now, granted, the other difference here is it's an overnight rate. LIBOR has an overnight rate and other term components, so that is is, is also quite a difference. And then lastly, LIBOR in and of itself um, has a, a, a small credit component um, that is that is part of the rate. But I will tell you, well, you know, folks, you know, say, well, wouldn't it be great if you just, you know, identified an alternative that is just like LIBOR and, you know, we would if we could. The fundamental issue is there aren't really any term transactions and there aren't really any sort of unsecured rates that have a partial credit component that, in fact, could work. So that's not really a viable alternative. Um, so here we really were focused on how do, we, how do we craft a benchmark that's fit for purpose, meets the standards of best practice, and is transaction-based. Well, take us through the transition plan for replacing LIBOR with SOFR. I mean, what are the key developments? I mean, give me some benchmarks that we're that you're trying to get to. Yeah, I, you know, firstly, you want to remind everybody that you know the use of this rate and 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 participation in the transition plan um, is really all voluntary. None of this is happening via regulatory fiat, but I will tell you, um, you know, from the perspective of, of all members of the ARC, the private and the public sector, it is in everyone's best interest, um, you know, to move forward in getting prepared because, again, you're getting prepared for the potential that LIBOR doesn't exist. So what are these, what are these pieces? Well, firstly, we had to craft a rate, um, and, and, in fact, we did, and that is a SOFA rate we've just been talking about, and that was launched um, in April 
of this year and is being prepared, um, you know, daily. Second part is you need to build liquidity. It's just like building a brand new market, which is what we're doing. Right. And in building liquidity, the second step is to launch futures contracts. And you will have noticed probably um, in May, the CME launched one and three month futures contracts that are tied to SOFR. Right. Yeah, um, and we're you, up to you, about, you also um, have seen, you know, um, um, an extension and expansion of other products. So um, OIS and basis swaps tied to SOFR have recently been launched by LCH. And, you know, to round out the, uh, the trifecta of some of the CCPs, ICE has, has noted that, you know, in the fall, they are going to launch uh, one in three months uh, features tied to SOFR as well. So the build out of the derivatives market, um, important. Once you get the liquidity um, developing there, um, we're we're likely going to see, uh, and this is a technical aspect, price aligned interest and and, and discounting rates move from the existing rate of Fed effective into this new SOFA rate, and that's going to be really important because that will embed demand in the derivatives books of all market participants that are clearing in a standardized way to want to use this rate. And then I would say, as we look to the future, those underlying basic cash products that use that use um, uh, LIBOR presently, seeing more issuance done tied to SOFR. And then again, I will note, because it, it, uh, it's very exciting watching these markets develop. Very recently, we saw um, you know Fannie Mae do a three-trance issuance totaling $6 billion, all tied to this new rate, SOFR. And the more issuance we see, um, you know, the, the deeper the market gets. And remember, when someone's issuing, that means an investor is purchasing as well. So you actually get two pieces of the market there. Um, those are all very, very critical and important. And then as I look to the, you know, even farther out in the future, um, you know, seeing this just become part of the normal fabric and the development of a term curve. And those are the basic components of the transition plan as they've been laid out. And, and again, and I think it's important to note, um, because if you're not close to this, people may see, oh, these are all things that are happening in a haphazard way. They're not. In fact, all those pieces that I've just referenced, they, they're part of the carefully crafted framework of how to drive the take-up in an orderly way of this new rate and build liquidity over time. And the U.S. is not the only country uh, developing a new rate, um, and, and, and every country that's out there is not following the same path as the United States. States. How does this complicate the mission? Yeah, well, you know, again, go back to where, where we opened the conversation. LIBOR is currently being prepared across five currencies. So each of those five countries has to figure out an alternative of what they're going to do if LIBOR ceases to be produced. The first thing I would say, all, all five um, uh, currency committees have selected an overnight rate because that is where the bulk of the liquidity in the short end markets is, and that ensures that their rate can be transactions based. The second part, though, is they can vary. Some countries are selecting a secured rate, some selecting an unsecured rate. It's much more reflective of what their jurisdiction um, um, uh, requires and needs, um, and and that's fine because the reality of you know how different is a secured versus an unsecured rate in the overnight market, while there is a small credit component in the unsecured rate, it's virtually zero. So they're they're actually quite similar and they perform in a similar way. Now, as you look to the potential for a, a, a level of basis risk, yes, basis risk can in fact um, you know be different. Um, but you know that's just part of markets in general, and 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 folks are equipped to you know measure, monitor, and then manage basis risk. Um, you know should it occur. I think the complication is. People may be at different paths along implementation um, as we as we look to sort of you know 2021, and that you know that again adds a little bit of complexity. But frankly, most of the um, 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 or I should say many of the companies that are engaged in the process and the working groups are engaged um, uh, and involved in discussions across the board. And frankly, um, as chair of the Alternative Reference uh, Reference Rate Committee for the U.S., I engage regularly with the other chairs. Um, and, 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 and try to ensure that we understand what the approaches are and look to minimize disruptions. I will tell you one thing that will be critical is a consistency on identifying triggers 
should they be necessary or not not should they they will be necessary on when um, legacy contracts will convert if LIBOR comes to a halt. Wow, that's a lot to unpack there. That was a lot. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's 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 fascinating, um, and and I think uh, it's really important that for, for everybody to understand that that the, all of the markets are moving forward with this uh, simultaneously. That not everybody's going to get there in the same time frame. You keep mentioning 2021. Why are you mentioning that date? Okay, so I, I, you know, this is a very important date because remember I told you Arc 1.0 started out because um, the Financial Stability Board and FSOC really wanted us to find an alternative for derivatives. About a year ago, um, the Financial Conduct Authority, you know, shed some really important light on the LIBOR, mar- LIBOR market. They basically said that they had been using their supervisory authority to. Um, ensure that panel banks continued to submit into LIBOR because those panel banks were getting more and more uncomfortable with having um, so much of the rate setting driven by their expert judgment. They're, they are justifiably concerned. And what, what Andrew Belly of the FCA said was, after 2021, he was no longer going to use authority to compel those banks to submit. And so, therefore, after 2021, there is a reasonable um, possibility that, in fact, panel banks may notify the marketplace and the uh, the benchmark administrator that they will no longer be submitting. Now, think about what that means. If they stop submitting, that means LIBOR is not going to be produced. And if LIBOR is not going to pre- be produced, well, what happens? And therein becomes another critical point of the concerns around financial stability, right? You need to look at what financial contracts say. And in the case of derivatives, current financial contracts say if LIBOR is no longer produced, well, perhaps you can call some of those submitting banks and they will provide you a rate. Well, clearly, if those banks are not submitting, they're not going to provide a rate sort of when you call them. So so the reality is these contracts never really contemplated a permanent end to LIBOR. They contemplated maybe, um, you know, not being available for a day or two. So those contracts need to be updated and addressed to figure out what will happen. The second thing is, you know, from from fallbacks where they may be appropriate, um, or I should say exist so that you can transact against them in the loan market, for example, um, the current, in, in some of the current contracts, you can fall back to prime. That works, right? Well, the contracts probably didn't contemplate the very different economic impact of moving from LIBOR to Prime. Prime is several hundred basis points higher than LIBOR. So that may or may not be the right outcome. So I focus on 2021 because that's a line in the sand that we know banks may stop submitting into panels. And two, we really need to address fallback language across a variety of products so that if LIBOR is no longer produced, the marketplace clearly knows how that next coupon will be set and on what basis. And clearly that fallback language, in our view, and for the U.S., will incorporate SOFR. Well, that's certainly a motivating force uh, <laughs> to get everybody yeah, moving so. forward. Uh, so one last question before I let you go. If you could know today something about something six months in the future that would tell you something positive about SOFR and its uptake, what do you think you would like to know? Oh, I think, you know, look, I, I'm I'm constantly appealed for indicators that people are transacting in the market. So open interest in the futures market uh, for SOFR will absolutely matter. Currently, open interest is around 27,000 contracts. I would love to see that continue to grow at the clip that it has been growing at. In fact, it's been outpacing how quickly euro dollars were growing when they were first launched in the 80s. So that's a good sign. Secondly, um, I'd love to, to, to see the volumes of actual issuance referencing SOFR, um, I would love to see those go up in a dramatic way. And then lastly, back to sort of a complicated piece that I just gave you, I would like to see the protocols for fallback language 
done and dusted, where market participants um, agree on it, and it is very clear and transparent what the triggers will be and what the order of fallbacks will be. Um, those will be most important. And I will tell you one more thing, because we, we didn't really have, ha, have, have the opportunity to talk about it. Um, the, the alternative reference rate committee that I referred to, the 2.0 reboot, um, I think it's just really important to note that after the comments made by Andrew Bailey, because it's very clear that this is no longer just of concern for derivatives, but more broadly for all cash products, the, the committee was reconstructed to now be comprised of um, 27 um, organizations that represent a wide variety of end users. So no longer um, just broker-dealers dealing in derivatives, but incorporates um, you know, insurance companies, incorporates um, the Federal Home Loan Bank, for example, and Fannie Mae, and incorporates trade associations like the Loan Syndications and Trading Association and SIFMA to to make sure that we are hearing the variety of voices because now it's not only about a pace transition for the derivatives market, it's about transition for all participants who are using LIBOR in their contracts. And we need to make sure that everyone is ready to participate in this new market and no one can be a bystander. Um, so you will see much more activity out of the Alternative Reference Rate Committee. We just you know, had another roundtable. We are going to consult on a variety of things that are under consideration, like term reference rates, like contract language, and it really is important that, that people... Um, engage. I will also say not only did we expand the membership to the broader uh, set of, of interested uh, corporate private sector parties, we also expanded the ex officio members. Um, so now incorporated beyond the Board of Governors and the Fed and the CFTC and the OFR and the Treasury, we also have, you know, the Bureau of Consumer Finance Protection, the SEC, the OCC, the FDIC, the FHFA. Those are, these are people who are really aligned to ensure that we mitigate financial stability, we deliver good outcomes, and we ensure that, you know, what is being put forward is fair and equitable. Chief Regulatory Affairs for J.P. Morgan Chasing Company, Sandy O'Connor, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Bye-bye, Andy. That's a wrap for this week. Remember, you can get access to all the shows we do here by either going on our website at cftc.gov or by getting out your phone, clicking on the podcast app, and typing in CFTC Talks. Click subscribe if you want to get them every week. I'm Andy Bush, Chief Market Intelligence Officer for the CFTC. Thanks for listening. This has been CFTC Talks. But wait, we're not done yet. It's time for a disclaimer. The CFTC is providing this information as a public service, and it is neither a legal interpretation nor a statement of CFTC policy. Reference to any specific product, service, trademark, manufacturer, or service provider does not constitute an endorsement or recommendation by the CFTC. The CFTC is not liable to any consumer or any third party for any direct, indirect, incidental, consequential, special, or exemplary damages or lost profit related to the use of the information provided or referenced in this podcast. Selection of guests on the podcast does not imply an endorsement of any particular individual or entity. Many individuals and entities provide similar services to those of the guests. The views and opinions expressed by the guests in the podcast are their own and not specifically endorsed by the CFTC. Moreover, the information provided in this podcast should not be construed as investment advice. Consumers should rely on their own inquiries as to accuracy and relevance of the information incorporated or referenced in this podcast and assume the entire risk related to its use. The CFTC is providing its interpretation of market trends solely to inform the public of a framework for projecting possible outcomes under different scenarios. If you have any questions concerning the meaning or application of a particular law or rule administered by the CFTC, please consult an attorney. Thank you.